All right, welcome back to not only the Locked On Nets, but also the Locked On Bucks podcast, because have you seen us do it before? It's a crossover episode. We're just days away from the start of the regular season, and what better person to get on with than, I guess, theoretically, our arch rival, Kane Pittman, host of the Locked On Bucks podcast, right? You, you bounced us out last season. It doesn't really matter uh, what circumstances happened for the Brooklyn Nets. We lost to you. You won the championship, or the, the Milwaukee Bucks won the championship, and now we get to kind of scrap it up before the season gets underway. Great to connect with you again. Yeah, I didn't get a ring. Just, just, to, just, to, just to clarify. <laughs> yes. I, I haven't. Uh, I was watching the Bucks broadcast the other day, and Marcus Johnson was talking on the broadcast that he got a text asking for his ring size. To be clear, I did not get the text asking for my ring size. But yeah, I, I think the Nets are probably the team I've done the most crossovers with for obvious reasons. I still feel like the Bucks and Nets are on a tier of their own. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, so uh, it's good to catch up. And Doug, yeah, well, Giannis anyway. gave you Giannis gave you a shout out, right? Then uh, then Giannis gave you some kind of shout out. That that feels like that's like half a ring, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. He he did uh, lobby the U.S. government to get me back in the country from Australia. So I mean, that, that was it's better than a was, ring. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Voting for well, citizenship. Do, uh, that, does that not work, right? <laughs> <laughs> go I mean going into go the ahead, season okay. it, it looks like it looks like these two teams are probably on something like a collision course our, our our fans want to know about this and I think maybe this is probably relevant to Bucks Nation too uh we'll just open up with this and then we'll move on to other relevant things do you, when you see the stuff happening with Kyrie around uh, around the Nets right now I'm interested in other teams takes around what you know people in Bucks land think about watching this team, like the Nets, which I think most people agreed were sort of prohibitive favorites going into the year, even with the way the Bucks ended last season. And then you see this sort of inner turmoil that happens, that's sort of happening on the Nets side. We've only talked about it in the context of the Nets so far, but I just, I, I do value sometimes these other outside of the Nets circle opinions around this. Like when do you see this happening? Is there this piece like, Oh, things are crumbling here <laughs> like that like or does it or does it not really is it is it not really germane to the way the buck season plays out well i think it is if you project ahead to the postseason i mean clearly the reason why the nets are by far the the overwhelming favorite is because they have three guys now you can certainly make the case if they only have two of them then they're still the favorites but the point i always come back to and i think zach Lowe is the guy that always makes this i always hear him bring this up if you have three superstars, not only do you have the overwhelming talent if everything goes perfectly, but you also have a little bit of insurance if you lose one of those guys. So if you cut back to two players, it does change the calculus a little bit, especially if you look at this Nets team and think, well, it's not like last year where Brooklyn made the in-season trade for James Harden. If you can't actually get anything for Kyrie Irving and then he's just a player that is unavailable, clearly it does change uh, the outlook for the Nets. And then I, I think the other point, just from a Milwaukee perspective, I've been saying this pretty consistently. Consistently, I think the Bucs are in the perfect position as defending champs because no one really cares about them. No one's talking about them. They go into the season with no pressure, really, and there's no drama. So I, I think that that's the big thing. That actually brings me to the point that I wanted to make off the top of the Milwaukee Bucks won the championship last year. And Doug and I always say there's only one championship every season. Nobody really cares when you look back about injuries or circumstances that happened along the way. The Bucks won the championship. And yet you come into this year and there's still a handful of teams that maybe you put above the Milwaukee Bucks in terms of being title favorites. Do you feel like the Milwaukee Bucks are deserving of more respect in that regard? Do they... Does that team have a sense of, hey, this is good for us to fly under the radar and we'll just see you in the playoffs again? And if things play out the same way, we like our chances. I mean, every team feels confident, even if you were taking on a full strength Brooklyn Nets roster, that you can beat them in a seven game series. But it does feel like the NBA consensus is, yeah, you won the championship, but there were certainly other circumstances for a number of teams that got you to that point. Yeah, and that's that's kind of always the case, isn't it? I mean, I think back to a team like Toronto, and and I always said this before the Bucks won the title for Raptors fans in particular. I would say, why would you care? Why would it even bother you if people say, yeah, but you won because of injury? Like it doesn't matter. Like you are the champion, and nothing's going to change that. So I, I think that there's a section of Bucks fans that don't really care about it, and then I think there is a section that are, are really bothered by the fact that they're not the favorites. But I think my big takeaway from media day and and speaking to these players is that I think they like it. I think they like going under the radar. They know that they're the champs. They're clearly enjoying themselves. The Larry O'Brien trophy has been on a world tour the last few months and, uh, and they're having fun with it. But I do think that 
Uh, first of all, they they had to overcome playoff and however it happened, they had to come overcome playoff demons that had haunted them the last two seasons. Now that pressure is off their back. They have the title, and I think that they're probably pretty comfortable with being. I think they're the third favorite. Looking at most most betting markets, mm-hmm. BetOnline.ag, I think I had them third. The Nets first, Lakers second. So. In all honesty, uh, if you talk about a team being disrespected, but they're still the third favorite for the NBA championship, it's like it, it's not the worst spot to be in. Third favorite, third favorite, <laughs> yeah, being third in line for being the yeah. best team in the league, arguably. The other thing too, I, I, I that I'm just curious about from uh, from your perspective, Coach Bud. You said exercising some of those demons, right? Overcoming some of their playoff concerns. He obviously wins the championship. You get the coaching extension. All of a sudden. You move past this thing. Do you think, was there any amount of having Giannis is what overcomes that? Obviously, you get Holiday. Did the players overcome those foils for themselves as much as anything that Coach Bud did or did not do last year? Because I I still wonder if it's a product of the players and just the quality of the team versus the coaching and, and different things that he did last year that warranted saying, yes, you're as much a part of winning this championship as anything that happened on the court. Yeah, there was a number of situations during that playoff run where Bud, <laughs> everyone had decided that he's about to coach his last game of the Bucks. And I always laugh thinking back to, it was during the second round against the Nets and Rick Carlisle just came on the coaching market and everyone was saying, well, we need to, can we, can we fire Bud midway through this series just so we can lock in Rick Carlisle? And it's obviously hilarious to think about now, but I think Bud does deserve some credit. I mean, clearly... And this is always the case. You win NBA championships based on superstars and superstar performances. And Giannis clearly was special. But I think the one trend that we saw throughout last season was that Bud was more willing to adjust. He was more willing to experiment. In the postseason, he was more willing to play his superstars the minutes that they should be playing in the playoffs. Still not as much as what Kevin Durant was playing, but that was through necessity rather than anything else. But the other thing that I think stands out to me, when you go back and you look at every single a playoff series, whether it was Miami in the first round or Phoenix in the NBA Finals. Game one was not very good. They started off these series very slow in every single series, and the longer the series went, they seemed to find the matchups, find the rotation, find the adjustments that were able to help them get on top. So I, I think it would be silly to to dismiss Bud and, and the way that he seemed to evolve the longer the season went. I gotta say, I, I look. I watched. We watched every single game last year. I, I, I do want. I do consistently forget that this was the second round matchup, and this yeah. wasn't the. It, it's really. I was sending a text to someone that I hadn't sent a text to in a really long time today, and our last text was about the Bucks and uh, the Hawks series, and I was like, "Oh right, the Bucks still had to play the Hawks." For <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, I had just sort of wiped that off. They had wiped the slate clean on that part, and just kind of, even though I watched every single game of the series, I just completely forgot. <laughs> that, that, that that series even happened. I mean, it kind of basically didn't happen. But um, as we as we go into the season here, do you think that, you know, a lot of people talk about the regular season now as if it's sort of a foregone conclusion. Um, it's almost a shame in some way that the storylines around the regular season end up being more about what's going to happen in the playoffs unless, unless you have some plucky upstart. And you kind of have to sometimes formulate new stories to talk about because – the regular season has become increasingly marginalized. Do you think that like the way that the Bucks and Nets are going to operate this season will just be along those lines that were, especially the Bucks now that have kind of just absolutely steamrolled through the regular season at times, <laughs> like just yeah. like historic sort of just dumpstering of other teams <laughs> as the season, as the season goes on point di- differentials that are nuts. You know, do you think they'll have a different, strategy this year because that's something that adam and i've been trying to parse out about the nets this season is like what the incentives are even going to be around the regular season and i hate to frame it that way so early because i want to get really excited about it and at the same time it's clear when we do these kind of crossovers that the conversation is about something different right it's I, i'm excited for basketball to come back i'm not exactly 100 percent sure the next 82 games for these these two teams are going to tell us all that much. Does that make sense? It's like a weird spot that sometimes certain teams can get into around the regular season. Yeah, I mean, the, the life of a contender in the regular season just feels like survival mode, right? I mean, you, you're just like, okay, let's, let's get through this. We know that you're going to win enough games. Like, that's the one right. thing you know unless disaster happens and knock on wood for both teams. So hopefully that's not the case. But you are just trying to get to the postseason healthy. I mean, that's that's the key part of the season. And I think the Bucks learned a bit of a lesson from the 2000 and 
2019 season and 2020. I mean, you spoke about the historic pace, but when the season shut down in 2020, they were still, they, they'd lost a couple of games. So I think they were on around 69 win pace. I mean, just ridiculous stuff. And it didn't exactly pan out for them in the postseason. And I think they learned that you need to do, you do need to have a little bit of adversity during the regular season, whether that's uh, trying different things, uh, different lineups, experimenting a little bit. So last year, I, I think the fact that they're actually the third team in the Eastern Conference, they didn't have home court advantage for the second round. Funnily enough, they did in the conference finals. Again, that's the way that that worked out. And then they didn't have home court in the NBA finals. I think they learned some lessons that, you know, maybe going, uh, you know, balls to the wall every single night, Tuesday night in Detroit, winning by 50 points, maybe it's not totally necessary. So right. I, I, th- yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. That's the, Well, that's the kind of what you're afforded by winning the championship, I think, too, because I guarantee this was not a conversation that most teams would have prior to this happening for them, right? It's like the regular season tells you everything you need to learn before you've won the championship. Once you won the regular, you realize very quickly the regular season, um, it's fun and it means something, but it doesn't mean it, the stakes become very, very different. Uh, more on this conversation as we get into uh, how these two teams are kind of shaking out. But if you're an NBA fan addict, you know that we are. You have to have heard about Prize Picks at this point. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I know this for a fact. You, I, I love this stuff. I know you will too. Prize Picks has NBA DFS props on more than anyone else in the market. If you go to some of these other competitor sites, you're dealing with salary caps. You're dealing with trying to fit uh, certain players that you want into the scheme that you want, into the salaries. It can be really, really tough. Prize Pick makes it super easy. They just have the props up there. And you choose, you know, is one player going to score this many points tonight or not? Are you going to go the over, the under? You pile some of them together, sort of parlay them. Prize Picks is offering a, uh, basically uh, something on the market that you really don't see very often. And it's just really what fans want. If you've been dealing with some of these other DFS sites, you have to head over to Prize Picks. It's made easy. If you uh, make a deposit right now, you're going to use a promo code. NBA for a hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars. You have to be a new account and you have to use that promo code NBA. You pick two to five players. You pick some over unders on their projections and you can win up to 10 X on any entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. You're not dealing with all those sharks out there. I've been in these waters before you can avoid it all on prize picks. Prize picks allows mixed uh, sport entries. You can just hey, do one for NBA, one for NFL, mix them all together. You're good to go. You can make those entries in up to 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize picks is safe and offer super fast withdrawals. Make sure you use the promo code MBA and prizepicks.com. Go to the app store, download the app today. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. So the one follow up then, Kane, just and this is really for both. It's for the Nets. It's for the Bucks. It's for any of the top teams in either conference, really. But in the East, Doug was saying about how much do you put on in the regular season? What are the expectations? Do you look at the Eastern Conference any differently getting to the playoffs and saying the the conference is a little bit deeper now? It's a little bit more talented teams on the back end here, and and there is some risk of whether it's losing early in the playoffs, okay, maybe not, but at least getting pushed further than you want to when you have the idea in your head, we're a finals team, we're an Eastern Conference finals team, we don't want to be going seven-game series early on when it is about being fresh and attacking. Do you worry about any of these other teams in the East when you look around right now? Not really. I, I think the one wild card team is. I think the one. It's fair. Wild, it's fair. That's the right response, to be honest. That's the right response. <laughs> yeah. I, and again, this is this is if all things. This is as Knicks aren't concerned right to you. Right the now. Knicks are not yeah. a scary team to you right now because there's been a lot of chatter around this city. <laughs> uh, well, I would say. I mean, great home court, great home court, great home court crowd. So shout out to those guys. But. Sure. But I, I think and this is if everyone's healthy. So it's easy to say this now. Obviously, things are going to change. But I just have the Nets and the Bucks so far ahead of anyone else. I, I, there's a really, there's a bunch of really solid teams. You mentioned obviously the Knicks, but Atlanta will be there, Boston, Miami, all these teams. Yeah. But I think for Milwaukee, there's only one team, and this will be a question mark that I think that as the regular season progresses, they'll probably ask themselves how hard do we want to go here for seeding? Because I do think that there's only one team in a game seven situation on the road in the East that they that would cause some concern. And that would be Brooklyn because of the talent, because they're obviously an elite team. Now we know they went there last year, but you know, you would 
suspect certainly your listeners will be hoping that there's different personnel on the floor so uh, i think that will be the question and that that'll be really interesting later in the season if the nets and the bucks are battling for seeding and a p- potential home court and i think we all hope this year it doesn't come in the second round this matchup it comes in the conference finals but i, I think that'll be uh, the big question mark for the bucks and probably the nets as well i mean we saw last year milwaukee had a chance to try and avoid miami in the first round and they said, eh, well, no, we don't really care. We'll just beat you in the regular <laughs> we'll, we'll beat you in the regular season, then we'll sweep you in the first round. That that turned out to be obviously maybe maybe a good mental move. Maybe that put them in a good space um, for that first round series. But I, I really have the teams below the Bucks and the Nets a, a, a fair way down. The wildcard team is Philadelphia. Last year going into the season, Brooklyn were the wildcard team. They made the trade. So can Philadelphia make a big trade to get into that top tier? I, I guess we have to wait and see. Yeah, I think that, and you know, you're bringing up that second round matchup. There was a part of the end of that season where it's really interesting if the Nets, and I think the Nets were trying for that. They, they were basically trying for that home, the the first seed near the end. It was it was close, and they kind of scraped up close enough to get there with Philly, and they weren't able to. They ultimately weren't able to do it. But if you look at how that series, you know, we mentioned or we talked about it just a minute ago, how differently the season plays out if they're if that matchup doesn't happen in the second round, right? Like that gives the Nets one more round to get healthy and it's looking, there's a good chance it plays out totally different. I think you're totally right in that I'm generally in the camp of seeding doesn't matter, except that this one certain, this one scenario, it does. <laughs> this is the yeah. one, this is the one where it really does. It, it's hard to imagine any of these other teams being as good. Although, I mean, Philly did it last year and if they bring everyone back, maybe they can do it again. But the, I think you're right. I think that's a situation both teams would look to would basically look to avoid because um, because it, it really wouldn't make sense to kill each other in the second round again <laughs> if we already just did that for for uh, for one year or excuse me one playoff round. Um, as the let me ask you a question about the the way the Bucks are structured this year as compared to last year. Obviously, they lose PJ Tucker. They uh, they retain Bobby Portis. Uh, your listeners are all going to know this stuff, so this is going to be old hat. But just for the Nets folks that maybe don't know that the Bucks team does look a little different now, right? There's no PG Tucker. They're going to get that Dante DiVincenzo back who was not there for the playoffs last year. Do any of those moves signal? I mean, they didn't really have much to grace and Allen. There wasn't really much turnover here with the Bucks team. This is a pretty, all things considered, this is basically the same team as they had last year, George Hill too. Do you think that the way the Bucks are structured going into the season is same as they were before? you know, better for the regular season, worse for the playoffs, better for the playoffs, worse for the regular season, like in the moves that they made sort of along the margins and with the Dante piece coming back, do you think that they're better set up the same or worse than they were, you know, heading to last year? Cause I, I mean, or, and I guess I'm mostly asking how important PJ Tucker was to them. Yeah. I think they're better for the regular season. And there's a question mark for the playoffs because when they traded for PJ Tucker, I mean, everyone looked at that and said, well, this is a trade for one series and one series only. Because if you look at the finals against Phoenix and the conference finals against Atlanta, there wasn't really a role for him. He was kind of just out there. There wasn't a specific matchup that he was doing. He'd shoot the odd corner three, but it was the Kevin Durant matchup. So I, I think for the Bucks, when they looked at how much they were going to have to pay him, they looked at the fact that he's already 36. The fact that, honestly, he limped through the regular season last year and then just gave it absolutely everything he had for seven games, I think they probably thought this is this is maybe not worth it. So they went and brought in Shemi Ojale, similar size player, obviously has never been the defensive caliber player that P.J. Tucker has been. But they're better for the regular season because Dante DiVincenzo, as you said, will come back. Grayson Allen's going to slot into the starting lineup. And actually, Grayson Allen is probably a... A more well-rounded offensive player than Dante is. Defensively, you lose a little bit, but I just think they're deeper. If you remember to the Brooklyn series, they were playing Jeff Teague minutes. They were playing Elijah Bryant minutes. Now they have George Hill. So they actually have a backup point guard that they could put on the floor and feel okay about. So they'll be a better regular season team and the depth will be important because obviously they had a long run, but then you had guys like uh, Chris Milton and Drew Holiday head to the Olympics, same with you guys with, with Kevin Durant. So I think having depth in the regular season will be good for them because they are going to have to be careful. These guys are going to have to be monitored through the the early portion of the season. And we'll see. They've got a roster spot. We know they're going to make a move. So who's the addition at the deadline going to be? Is it going to be a trade? Is it going to be a buyout guy? We'll see. Do you then think, too, that you know you mentioned about the, the biggest matchup, Brooklyn, uh, Milwaukee, those are the top two teams. You see what the 76ers do. Then from the outside looking in for for the Nets fan base, 
the moves that the Nets made in the offseason, and maybe we talk about backup point guard, right? Patty Mills, was that something when you look at the Milwaukee Bucks and how they maybe want it to be structured? And do you look at the Nets team with that addition, bringing back Bruce Brown, Blake Griffin, and then even a Paul Millsap, obviously LMA coming out of retirement. Do the Nets look like a, a deeper, more well-rounded team that presents different type of matchup problems for the Milwaukee Bucks? Whereas even at full strength, it would have been a different outcome, we think. And at the same time, the size and the length that was there for Milwaukee is what was going to present problems for Brooklyn no matter what last year. It'll be interesting. And first of all, Patty Mills, clearly uh, I'm a fan. Uh, very, very disappointing because it's, it's un-Australian to to say anything negative about Paddy Mills, and he's always, <laughs> no. and he's always been at the Spurs. So you know everyone's fine with the Spurs having success. They were such a juggernaut for so long. Paddy Mills, ultimate role player, and now he now he's joined the Super Team, which I think by by definition means that he's he's got to be a villain now. But I can't quite bring myself to feel that way about him. So so we'll wait and see. But that's obviously going to be a really good addition, and and I think the reason why is because. Even if Kyrie Irving, let's just say he doesn't play for the season, it doesn't really matter. Like I would suspect, and you guys would know way better than me, but I would suspect that he's probably still going to come off the bench because you have James Harden, he can play at point guard. And yeah. Patty Mills, the beauty about Patty Mills is that he doesn't need the ball in his hands. He's great mm-hmm. off the ball, an excellent shooter, excellent catch and uh, shoot guy running around screen. So I think he's going to be a massive weapon and and provide real scoring punch, potentially six man of the year candidate. So I think overall the Nets added depth with you know Paul Millsap. You already mentioned Lamarcus Aldridge. I, honestly, I, I think the biggest question for me, and we spoke about this guy before the Bucks played the Nets. What do you think is going to happen with Nick Claxton? And, and do you care? Because it's such a strange thing. Because now I was watching him in this preseason game last week, and I, I'm watching this guy out there playing the last five minutes with the the garbage time lineups, and I'm like. Man, it's going to be tough for this guy. I just don't see how he's going to play. And maybe I know, oh. I know there's a portion of Nets fans that have. Let me let me feel this one, Doug, because we know how. Yeah, close I was going to say because Adam and I can both. Heart. <laughs> <laughs> we have like such long thoughts or differing thoughts, but we have such long thoughts about classic. We uh, before Adam says this, I'm not going to actually answer the question because I'm just going to say we have this lo- like this struggle where we kind of want to talk about Claxton every episode in some way, <laughs> except it's just not, it's like, it's so far against the tenants of the show slash the network, because it's unclear how much anyone wants to hear about Nick Claxton, although the fans love him and stuff. But anyway, Adam, Adam can feel the Nick Claxton question, but it's like, we go through this every, he's, he's the, he, I will say it's the guy that I think most fans want to talk about the most. And so we really struggle on a podcast, to podcast basis about how to, talk about a guy that like you said played five minutes of garbage time with the backups at the end of a, at the end of a preseason game but fans yeah, I, fans love that that it's the same with the bucks and we, they've got a really talented player jordan war that's coming through was was really good in the olympics for nigeria he's just an absolute bucket but fans love anytime they can latch on to a young player with with talent yeah. and that's that's claxton but that, and that's that, I mean that that's me. Like even coming into get coming onto the network, and we've been covering this team for three years, three plus years. I always love the young player because I the promise is all there in front of them. They could be anything. This guy could turn into anything possibly. Um, so it's an exciting thing to think about. Unfortunately, and this will probably Doug and I have gotten I think to this place, and he's had to give me doses of you know reality <laughs> along along the way. It, it, honestly, at this stage right now, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I, I finally got to the place where it's over for Nick. He got put into the mix with all these other young players. That doesn't mean it's y- done for him in terms of his his uh, Nets career, but he is far closer to being uh, a player working on his game in the G League than he is to being on, on the starting day roster for the Brooklyn Nets. It's just a reality. And when you hear him in the, the media day session, <laughs> which was we joked about this with Matt Brooks, he said, yeah, I've been working on my game, putting on weight, was asked how much weight have you put on? He said, well, it's not really about a pounds thing, but I feel good. <laughs> so it's like, it's this weird thing where you want to see him develop. But then when you see him out there with, especially with talented veterans, and then even among the other rookies that the Nets brought in, you go, oh, you're just kind of a player in this group now. So I think when you get him alongside other young talent, you start to bring him down to earth a little bit and um, we can move off of it. But unfortunately, yeah, it's it's going to be, it's going to be quiet times for Nicholas Claxton, I think until he's afforded maybe an opportunity to show that he's added something new to his game, which mainly is a shot. Because if you don't have that, all the defensive diversity, versatility in the world means nothing. So the, the perfect thing to describe Claxton is those memes you see sometimes where people describing their jobs and they'll say, you know, what what my friends think I do and then what my <laughs> parents think I do. And then like what I really do, it's like these four different, three or four different pictures. That's the Claxton experience because it's like what the other people in the NBA think about him. 
what he thinks about himself, what the fans think about him. And then the reality is he's just not going to play <laughs> like everyone that everyone. There's four different competing realities when it comes to Nick Claxton. And my strong inclination here is that, uh, that he's going to be about as far down the bench as possible. And he's up for a 50 plus million dollar extension here. So if the bucks are interested, feel free to feel free to knock on our door. <laughs> we'll do a sign and trade here, buddy. And it's a, it's a sweetheart deal for the Milwaukee bucks. Listen, I was talking about this on Locked On Bucks the other day. There is always a young big guy that Giannis uh, really forms a, an a, a tra- attraction with in terms of their hard work and bringing them up and supporting them and, and ultimately dunking all over them at practice. We've had Thon Maker. We've had, Chris, <laughs> we've had Christian Wood. We've had Mamadi Diakite. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe Nick Claxton is the next guy. But the reason I asked you about Nick Claxton is because I do want to ask you about the big man department with Brooklyn, because I think it, I think it's interesting, particularly when you look up, uh, look at this matchup with the Bucks. But speaking of Claxton, uh, I guess you might see a fair bit of him on the bench with a Theragun in his hand. Would you say? I mean, I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think that's a chance this season. So, uh, speaking of Theragun, don't let the stress of daily life weigh on your body. Whether you're an elite athlete or someone like me just trying to make it through the day, tension free Theragun can help. Theragun is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combo of depth, speed, and power, and it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. The Gen 4 Theragun doesn't just feel good. It gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension using Theragun's signature percussive therapy, which goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. So you can try Theragun for 30 days, starting at only $199. Go to therabody.com slash locked on right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's therabody.com slash locked on, therabody.com slash locked on. Do you and guys... Of course, you could say, by the way, no, no, don't, don't even worry about it, Kane. We're ready to go right, right into it here as once he's done with the Theragun, what Nick Claxton is going to want to reach for is a built bar because mm-hmm. this thing is going to give him that little dose of protein that he needs to make it up and down the court more than twice without getting winded. And you can head over right now when you go on the website. We always talk about this. You know, Doug Norrie has to fend off family members from stealing these boxes when they come <laughs> to the house. You've got the flavors like coconut, cherry, barcia, raspberry. Me, this week, I always give you a sample. I say go with salted caramel. That's just where I'm at these days. Doug Norrie's a big strawberry guy. Don't let him deny that. Kane Pittman, I'm pegging you as an orange man. That's right. Don't even bother answering. I know it's the truth. And the good thing about it is when you get inside the stats on these bars, it's not just great tasting and good for you. They're healthy options. When we're talking about 17 to 18 grams of protein, calorie range from just 130 to 180, only four to five grams of sugar, and only four to five grams of net carbs. It's amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy for you. Go over to Built.com right now and use promo code locked on and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code locked on for 15% off at built.com. So we have, as we enter this season, and again, rosters could be subject to change as, as we move forward. But if we scratch Nick Claxton from the list of potential Yana stoppers on the Brooklyn roster, we're left with Blake Griffin, who, by the way, I think probably did the best job out of anyone in the postseason. It's crazy, but yeah. it's it's a fact. And look, they've seen a lot of each other. They've they've typically got pretty heated with each other when they've when they've played in Detroit and Milwaukee matchups there. Uh, then you obviously have Lamarcus Aldridge coming back in. You've got Paul Millsap. So you're really throwing the old man brigade at Giannis because this is the way that the Bucks. We've always looked at this with Philadelphia in years gone by. Okay, how do we match up with Joel Embiid? What are we going to do to stop him if we get a potential postseason? So when you look at the big man department, is do you feel comfortable with with the rotation you have there as it as it currently stands? Um, it's it's one of these funny things. This is one where I think actually the regular season will tell some stories that we're not. You know, for the most part, I don't need to see Kevin Durant play to know what's going to happen. He can kind of do whatever. James Harden, I think we feel pretty comfortable around that. There are some regular season stories where it is worth it to tune in, and this is this is going to be one of them, is how the big man rotation sort of works itself out. There was a piece done, Adam and I will talk about this later, piece done uh, this week about the 538 basically said the Nets have seven centers. I, they were playing pretty fast and loose there, I think. But the <laughs> the, the, the Bruce, general Bruce thought... Brown. But, Bruce Brown, uh, they, still, you still can count, he's, a def- he's, an offensive, he's an offensive center. You can count him. Yeah, yeah. Um, the general gestalt of that was that the Nets have this plethora of options that they can that they're going to walk into the season and like I think they chose optionality over the uh, like we're just going to bring in one person to do one thing, right? We're going to have I think they, they're giving themselves these probably four or five different options. 
um, depending on the matchup. We saw what happened the other night with Embiid. He absolutely trucked them. Like they don't really still have a good option for that. Like that that is a uh, that's not something that they seem either concerned with dealing with or are not prepared to. With the honest thing, I think that they did. I agree with you. Blake was a, an effective speed bump against Giannis. And they, that's all you can really hope to do with him, right? Slow it down. Like you're not going to stop him, but can you slow it down enough? Can you like get in his way enough? Do you have a wide enough body? Blake hit that. I think actually Millsap hits part, you know, deals hits some of that. Um, not all of it. Aldridge, Chu, James Johnson, you'll probably see a little bit of him. Like James Johnson has some size and strength that, again, do, would you want to play him 40 minutes against Giannis? No, but can you get 15 minutes of chipping him for, you know, and have it work out to your advantage? Maybe. I think this is, this is the long way to say they made a lot of these moves to probably start mixing and matching it during the season to see what looks right. And I don't actually don't think judging what we've seen in the preseason that they even know yet, like what the exact right combinations are, because we saw a lot of, we saw some different combinations in the preseason. The Nets looked bad in the preseason. I don't really know another way to put it. Um, But the, I, whatever but i think that that is part of what the thinking here was there's no good Giannis solution really the nba doesn't really have one <laughs> right now that he's a pretty he's a total unicorn but if we can throw enough different bodies at him and we saw guys like blake be effective enough because if you can be effective enough and then have the offensive firepower you are going to win a series against the Bucks like that. And so I think we'll see different combinations. And I actually think those will be the interesting ones to tune into during the regular season to see what they do, like what, who gets thrown at him the most, or, or do they just use a bunch of different bodies and a bunch of different looks to try to confuse them? No one they have now is athletically good enough to really deal with him over a long period of time. Like they can't do, they currently couldn't do to the Bucks what the Bucks did to, with PJ Tucker and Kevin Durant, which is to say, go stand next to him for 48 minutes, right? And like run around with them. They do not, that is an option they do not currently have. I think what they're probably hoping is to death by a thousand paper cuts and like have enough, few different guys to do a few, enough different little things to deal with it. Because there's no, there's no person on the roster that, that is a one for one comp. I don't, I don't see it. Maybe Adam sees it, but I, I don't see one right now. No, and by the way, because the, the, we, we just talked about that preseason game against Philly and saying there's certain players, you say an Embiid, right? You you, you look at, at the Joker and you say there's certain players that there isn't the answer to. And Embiid, this goes along the, uh, sorry, uh, Giannis goes along the lines of what he accomplished last postseason where everyone talked about, boy, this guy doesn't always seem to want to lean into the best areas of his game at the most opportune times. Then he starts to do it. The Bucks kind of become unstoppable, and they win a championship, right? So at that point, I don't think that you go into an offseason saying, who's the guy that'll shut down Giannis? Because they don't exist, right? There isn't, there isn't that simple solution to it. Maybe the problem is it's like an NFL analogy of when they say, we got three great quarterbacks in the room. Yeah, well, when you got three, you don't have any, right? So we've got a lot of bodies we can throw at Giannis. Yeah, well, when you say you got a lot, it means you really don't have anything. Like with so many matchups for Brooklyn, though, it's about what, the Nets do on the offensive end, overcoming whatever they lack on the defensive end. So they, they come into the season in the same way. They're better prepared for those type of matchups, but it doesn't mean that they have the answers. So I guess, and it's to the surprise of no one, that obviously we're going a bit long here, but uh, I do, you guys have been speaking about it absolutely daily. So this again is for my uh, locked oh, on Bucks, Kane, locked on Bucks listeners here. It's a selfish <laughs> question to finish up. <laughs> but everyone's watching this situation with, Extreme interest with Kyrie Irving. So what's your prediction? What, what do you think is going to happen here? Obviously, as we're recording this and, and for the Locked On Bucks listeners, we're, li we're recording this prior to Milwaukee playing Utah, um, despite the fact you'll probably be listening to this on Friday. So just for, you know, we know things are probably going to change in the next 24 hours. That's my point here. But, but what are you predicting? Uh, you want to, I, I can, I can take this one. I think, well, sure. I think Adam and I might have different, different takes on this, but, um, well, let's find out. I think <laughs> what happens here, this is a totally, this is, I'm totally guessing at this, but Adam and I texted about this very thing last night is that based on just like sort of the last little bits and bobs of stuff that's come out, I think he ends up playing and I think he's going to sort of take an L on whatever the stance originally was and work it back into 
a different sort of talking point. You can sort of already see that happening right now. Is that like the 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 talk around the vaccine specifically from his camp is starting to change based on well, no, well let me put it he ne- no he never said anything it's all made up he's never said <laughs> as we as we record this thir- wednesday evening he's never said anything to the media at all so it's all been third hand sourced sources and quotes whatever i think if i were to again i'm not this isn't sourced personally i think he comes back and plays because this has sort of gone sideways and um I agree. Actually. And I think no, I, I, okay. I agree. I agree with and Doug, I think yeah. just, they'll come up with some other like you already saw that the the the, the Shams Tarania thing about standing up for vaccine um, hesitancy around, you know, the workplace and stuff like that. Like it was already like the, the, the narrative is already starting to change a little bit. And I think that this is paving the way for, hey, I brought something to light that people need to hear about this is an unfair treatment of people. This is like, I'm putting words in his mouth here, but um, this is unfair treatment. People shouldn't be treated around this, around this thing. And I got it out there and now I'm going to do it because I brought and it. And by the like, way, also my- laid the path to say that I, I was never against the vaccine. So now I can, I can go and get it, which is the stepping, yeah. which is the thing, the roadblock in front of me from being able to play with the team. So uh, yeah, I, I agree. And by with the way, I, I, like we're like we as two guys that have just talked about Kyrie tons, this would fit like a lot of the stuff that's happened in the past. <laughs> like that kind of this sort of timeline, <laughs> this sort of timeline would be very on brand for the other things that we've seen happen before multiple seasons worth would be this would have checked a lot of those boxes. So my predict, I, well, I guess Adams too. our prediction, I think is going to be a month or something like that. And he says he brings out a couple points and then he's back on the court. That's my that's my dime store guess. By the way, prediction versus desire, two different things. Yeah, nothing yeah, nothing would surprise me anyway. Let's be honest. And uh, I guess the follow up is this is his last season in Brooklyn. Are we all? I think, and we saw another again. There were all reports and they come out that said they're not going to offer him an extension. Of course, if you're Brooklyn. Uh, and and that's the case. You have to weigh up. Uh, can we get this guy to be a major part of a championship team this year? Or do we try and find anyone that's willing to trade for this man this season? I mean, it's it's a fascinating uh, sort of uh, point they found themselves in. Yeah, well, this is too, like he's on the okay. he's on the player option for next year is a little bit north of 36 million. So just from a opt in standpoint. Um, you know, Kyrie is incentivized to want to pick up that player option as opposed to potentially enter the market. Now, it doesn't mean teams are going to offer him money. Again, one of the things we always mention throughout all this is if it's, you know, breaking news, he's one of the best players in the game. So there would be suitors for him. Uh, I, I, I think clearly the Nets have backed off of the commentary around Harden and Kyrie and getting those extensions locked in as well. This is specifically with Kyrie, you're, you're going to step away from it. Do I think there's no world where they can, if it goes the way Doug and I think, and he comes back and plays and is a part of the team all the way through the season and helps win a championship, the extension talks can get ramped right back up and they can find their way back to that. I, I think that's the that's the hard thing that you sign on for when you have superstar talent like this or, or personalities like Kyrie is, yeah, you, you know what you get when you live with some of the other side of it. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't hear any additional talk around that until after this season, though, where the Nets feel like they can get a clearer sense of of what direction Kyrie wants to go and how does how does Harden feel about it? How does KD, who already is on the extension and clearly the most important piece of this, in this franchise, how do they feel? And like, and and just to actually paint this in in a in a way that bucks people with, I think see it too is like the thing that's happening in the moment is rarely the thing that happens forever, right? So we talked about at the beginning of the podcast that Coach Bud was probably a toe away from being fired, right? Like a, a Kevin Durant big toe from be, ever being on the Bucks again. And uh, as a coach and then is now a coach for a long time, right? Like it just, it, things can change so quickly that I've tried at least, and maybe, I don't know. I think maybe just talking about basketball long enough is that I tried to really slow down my, <laughs> the hot take piece of it because I'm like, it just doesn't take much for it all to change immediately. These guys are wired totally differently. They are just, they're professional athletes. They no most professional athletes. They're one of the, their, their best skill of all is not being affected by the thing that happened the day before. Like it be by being able to move on with whatever happened the day before good or bad and just move into the next day and do it. And like, I think sometimes it's easy as fans to forget about that because 
it seems like in the moment the sky is falling and then you just get a month later it's like oh yeah he's back on the court and everyone loves each other again and they're winning games like it just really can change that quickly by the way this is me glass half full it could not happen like this <laughs> like it, he could we could be talking we could be in june and be like man he's out of the whole season this is nuts but i, I do try to remember that things in the moment that seem like they're certainties especially in basketball it doesn't take long for the the whole narrative to change pretty quickly so i'm really hoping that's what happens in that vein, Kane, how long before you expect Giannis to request a trade? Just to <laughs> yeah, I, I, listen, it, it's funny. I mean, the extension has only just kicked in this season, and when we were talking about it at the start of uh, last season, one of the points that we were you know, you know, making is that this is fantastic uh, that he signed the extension. Obviously, great for the team; it takes pressure off them. Great for the city. Great for the fans. Um, but it doesn't mean that he can't request a trade. Now, I think you know, winning a title before that extension even kicked in. Um, certainly probably the best way that uh, that they could have could have uh, followed that signing up with. But yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I think... Can I ask you, I mean, on a serious question? Because from the outside, everyone says that Giannis is that unique type of superstar personality that wants to stay with the franchise that feels comfortable. I mean, is that legitimate or is it to your point? Like, yeah, I'm that kind of guy and I want to stay here as long as we're a really competitive team and I can win titles. Like, there is a there's a fine line there of being generous with your decision making versus yeah if the team starts being middle of the pack in the east then maybe i don't want to be here yeah i think he's also super stubborn and and competitive so we saw it as soon as they won the title he straight away called out everyone he's like yeah i could have joined a super team <laughs> that's but yep. instead <laughs> instead, I just, instead i just won it by myself and and he's always been that kind of guy and i think part of it is is the the way that he's grown up, everything he's gone through, and being an international player. You know, he didn't grow up in America playing alongside these other superstars and having those relationships. He's not on Team USA. So to him, I think I always thought the chances of him uh, running to to go play with LeBron or go play with someone like that were were significantly reduced compared to your your American superstar that 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 seems to be more of a trend that we've seen across the league. So Certainly, I mean, if they if they didn't win the title, and in two years down the track, Chris Milton is is traded because of the salary issues. Brook Lopez is obviously beyond his prime at that point, and they become a a playing tournament team. Yeah, the, the pressure probably begins uh, to build there. But you know, I, he is different. I, I don't think that's overplaying. And and I all will right. send oh, you God. Kyrie Irving for Giannis straight up. I'm just I don't have all the connections, <laughs> but I'm just saying if you feel like it's the smartest thing to do ahead of the season, we're willing to commit. to Who that. says no? <laughs> All right, this has been awesome. Kane Pittman locked on Bucks. Uh, we're locked on Nets, depending on what feed you listen to. I say it for both of our feeds here. Subscribe to the YouTube channels, the Locked On Bucks YouTube channel, the Locked On Nets YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe. Try to boost those numbers up. Every single episode going up on both feeds. Uh, this has been great. I'm sure we're going to talk to Kane Pittman, and Kane Pittman will talk to us as the season goes on. As there's no one else in the East that's even worth talking about. So I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's a. I don't think, like 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 locked on. You know, Doug, we still have more crossovers to do with other teams. Come on, buddy. This well, is, no one's gonna, they're not going to listen to this. They're not going to listen gotcha. to this. Yes, and right. no one, unless someone aggregates it and tells them. Like no one, if you're like one of those people that aggregates and tell and tattletales and just you know look yourself in the mirror. What I'm going to say is there's no one else worth to talk to. And yes, we'll probably do some other cross other cro- other crossover podcasts. They won't be as fun or as meaningful. But that's just the way this the NBA works. What do you want to tell you? We're, there'll be other years where it won't be like that. But just this year, this is the way it is. Locked on butts, locked on nets. And we all think, by the way, Kane, as we like to do at the end of our shows, think we're so smart. These teams organizing, competitive, looking to win championships. But everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Bert Einstein. <laughs> oh, one of the all-time great poets. Thanks, Kane Pittman. Locked on nets, locked on bucks. We'll be back again next week talking more basketball.